We're going to get started. If you would all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You know, it has quite a different <laughs> ring to it with this many people, so. Uh, welcome. This is the public hearing on the 2016 budget for the Shawnee County. My name is Kevin Cook. I serve as the chair of the county commission, also representing District 2. Joining me today, I have Commissioner Bob Archer, representing District 3. Good afternoon. Morning. And uh, Commissioner Shelley Bueller, representing District 1. I knew I would do that. Good <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I would do that. We don't have a agenda per se for this evening. However, in order to, for us to get started, what we're going to do is have a brief presentation from Betty Greiner. She is our Director of Administrative Services. She helps us work in crafting the budget. And then we'll. I guess we'll open with the public hearing first, and this is being prompted by the clerk. So <laughs> I'm sorry. I so would make a motion to open for the public hearing. Second. Motion made to open the public hearing, seconded by Commissioner Archer. All in favor say aye. All opposed? Passes three to zero. So, Ms. Griner, if you could start us with a brief overview of our budget for 2016 as we have it presented so far. Okay. Uh, I've uh, supplied some. Uh, budget request sheets that were out um, right outside the door there. Also the same information is up, up here on the screen. I'll kind of go over a little bit the information on here. Uh, you will see on the left hand side of the uh, different columns here and then over on that side um, are the different categories. We start out with the administrative services category and all the departments um, that are grouped under that are all together with a total. Then we go on to public safety, public works, public health, parks and recreation, which includes um, Expo Center and other items, and then uh, debt service. Then clear down here on the bottom, we have special liability fund. That is a separate fund, but it is levied um, with ad valorem taxes. Can you, oh, well, I'll get it in just a second. Um, then, um, as you'll look at the columns, the first column is the 2012 actual expenditures. Now, that was what was actually as, as spent by that department in 2012. The next column is the 2013 actual expenditures, 2014. The next column is 2015 budget. The next column is 2015 budget adjusted. In 2015, we have a um, extra pay period. We have a 27th pay period because we pay every two weeks. So that is, um, we will not have that in 16. So I have adjusted down for that. Um, but we also gave pay increases or wage increases in 2015. So I've adjusted up for that. So that's what that column is that says 2015 budget adjusted. That's what I would call a flat budget. If we were going into 16 with a flat budget, then that would be um, that would be it. And then the last column is the 2016 budget request, and that's what each department has requested. Uh, to go over our schedule a little bit, we started out with um, budget requests being turned into the audit finance department by May 15th. They were reviewed and then presented to the commissioners on June 1st. Uh, beginning on July 1st, we had hearings with each of the departments or organizations that were requesting funds. Um, all of those were streamed live but also recorded on our website so you can, you know, anyone in the public can still go and watch any of those public, public or not public, budget hearings, departmental hearings. Um, tonight is our public hearing. Um, and the, the list here that I passed out of the budget request, that's also online. So if anyone didn't get a copy um, or any of those listening at home can go on the uh, website and look at those. On Thursday, uh, we will begin, the commission will begin making decisions 
on individual departments and allocations. That will continue during each Monday and Thursday meeting until a final budget is approved by the Commission. The, um, the discussions, again, will be streamed live. Um, they will also be recorded, as are all of the Commission meetings, and will be available on our website, not only by audio, but by video also. Uh, then Kansas statute dictates that the final budget must be approved by August 25th. At that time when that is uh, finalized, I'll put that on the website also. Oh, any questions? Any questions? Thank you very much, Peggy. Okay. Would you like me to get this back up? Please. <laughs> While this is coming back up on the screen, I might just note we don't have a sign-up sheet or time limits on the amount of time that a person can speak, but please do just try to be conscientious of uh, everybody else and their time as well, so make your points. Um, if you do come and go, please be courteous to other people as you are coming and going uh, so that we are not disruptive to other people that may be speaking. And also, as you come to the podium, please identify who you are so that our clerk can have that properly recorded. With that, I'll open the floor to... Absolutely. Thank you, Earl. Thanks, Earl. You live at the peak of being interested in where the, who all takes the money out of your homeowners uh, from your home. You're welcome to have a sheet uh, pass that around. Just seems like I was here last year. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'll wait to you. Ready? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. My name, my name is Earl McIntosh, and um, I live at 4208 Southwest Stony Brook Drive, Topeka, Kansas, 6661. I'm sorry, 66610. Um, I am here in opposition to a tax increase, a mill levy increase on our property. And sh property. And I handed each one of you a sheet. The reason I handed you a sheet that I want you to know, you're not the only game in town that wants my money. There are eight entities that want to take money from my home, my personal pocket. The largest being the school, the second largest being the county. Uh, the city, the, next, the city of Topeka, the public library, the Metro Transit, Washburn University, Metro Airport, and the state of Kansas all take money for my, my house. That comes up to about 162.662 mills. So, I am here to say that it is unfair what you take from me and homeowners in the, in the city of Topeka and the county of Shawnee. You take more than your fair share. It's unfair what you've taken. You've gone overboard, and I'm asking you to not raise. Uh, homeowners can't afford it anymore. Let me give you an example. Here in Topeka, we are the top 10 cities per the Capital Journal for renters. Homeowners leave this city and build outside the city. Um, we have whole neighborhoods of just renters because nobody can afford to own homeowners any homeowner own a home anymore. We have per the Topeka Capital Journal, we pay the Topeka pay some of the highest property taxes in the state. And I want to talk to you about a hundred thousand dollar home. The newspaper always writes, "Well, we're just going to take seventy bucks on a hundred thousand dollar home." I find that very offensive. I find that very misleading. You don't. That comes from your perspective, not the perspective of the homeowner. A, a person who owns a $100,000 home five years ago averaged about $1,000 a month mortgage pay. Fast forward five years to now, they're about $1,500 a month mortgage. That's, they can't, that's unsustainable. That's all these entities taking taxes plus insurance increases. That causes their mortgage to rise these months. And that doesn't even include the water, the electric rate they're just getting ready to raise that goes up every year, the cost of schools, the cost of living on everything we buy is up, 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 up. And I just, I, I believe all of you are good people and that you care about this county. But what you do has ripple effects. Everybody wants their little bit, but it all adds up. 
And this homeowner, this $100,000 homeowner, as you like to talk, is in deep, dire trouble. You take more than your fair share. I tell you this every single year, and homeownership gets worse and worse in Shawnee County. Our country is in deep trouble financially. You cannot tax this plate, our county, into prosperity. And I'm asking you to have some empathy for homeowners. We pay more than our fair share, and I just want to hear my voice being heard while I still have my voice being heard. Um, salaries are down. Nobody in the private sector is getting raises. I've had, in the past year, my salary cut for my job. I don't have a retirement. You guys, the elected officials, you guys benefit from CAPERS. You're into the retirement system. Most of the private sector doesn't have your retirement um, and has no benefits. I have no benefits. Um, I, I just want you to know the private sector is in deep, deep trouble, and you keep taking from a smaller and smaller group of people, and it's not fair what you take. There's got to be a breaking point to what's fair and what's not fair. I'm asking for a moratorium on what's fair especially for that $100,000 house you guys like to throw around. That $100,000 house is in deep, dire trouble with husband and kids and all the expenses they have to do. Um, I think that's about it. I, I gave you this sheet, and I passed some around to show us who all take money out of our house. And if you raise our taxes, I mean, there's nothing I can do about it, but I think it would be mean. I think it would be mean-spirited. We can't take any more. It gets worse and worse every year. It's exasperating. People are hurting. They're hungry. They can't even afford to pay their bills. I've worked with homeowners for the past 20 years. That's all I do is work with homeowners. I have people in my office crying all the time because they can't afford to live. And they have to, especially like maybe a, a, a widow, the indignity of living in a house for 50 years and raising their kids and having to move because they can't afford it. But this is what you guys are doing. I don't have all the answers, but... I'm telling you, we're at that breaking point. I'm asking you to have somebody do some research. The $100,000 house, I would like the Capital Journal to t talk on their side instead of just, oh, it's just this much for a $100,000 house for Shawnee County when we have eight other entities that are taking taxes out too. So thank you for your time. I appreciate your service, and thank you for taking the heat. Thank you, Earl. Good evening, commissioners. <clears throat> My name is Phil Esau. Uh, I am a member of JUMP, a Justice and Unity Ministry Program. Uh, I'm also a member of Southern Hills Mennonite Church. About two and a half months ago, more than 600 concerned citizens met together in a forum to lift up the problem of the revolving door in Shawnee County. Kansas, Shawnee County, Kansas, in which many people with mental illness are trapped this revolving door involves crisis intervention services, emergency room resources that are not equipped to deal with mental illness, the rescue mission, law enforcement intervention, and the county jail. This revolving door happens when mental health crises prevail over successful treatment plans. It is noteworthy in this conversation that a study from the Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City tells us two things. The number of people in need is overwhelming, more than 10,000, while our community mental health center only has the capacity to serve about 7,000. This revolving door costs our community resources, the homeless shelter, jail, and hospitals, millions of dollars for treatment that does not lead to recovery. We believe that all involved members of our community agencies and decision makers agree that prevention prevention is the key to eliminating the revolving door syndrome that describes the experiences of so many individuals with mental illness in our county. I know that uh, at our Nehemiah Action Assembly back in May, Commissioner Bueller and Commissioner Cook agreed that services that lead to prevention is the way to address this problem. We appreciate your presence. We appreciated your expressions of concern and support and your proactivity in bringing an appropriate solution, a resolution to this problem. And we appreciate your openness to, to an evidence-based model 
of supported employment being a potential partial solution. Right now in Shawnee County, crisis is prevailing over recovery, and that is not acceptable. So, what is missing from the recipe that leads to recovery? Law enforcement and corrections now have programs that seek to divert people away from jail. There is still a lot of work to be done there, but they are making progress thanks to CIT and the Alternative Sentencing Court. And we have a local community mental health center that works through treatment plans on a consistent basis with as many clients as they can. The National Alliance on Mental Illness will tell you that those interventions are minimally effective unless the person being diverted from jail and on the treatment plan has adequate housing and gainful employment. Our community at large has to step in. Gainful employment is a key factor in recovery for at least 60% of the people with mental illness and a model called individual placement and support is an evidence-based way to fill that gap. Vallejo Behavioral Health is currently a provider of a program that uses the individual placement and support model of supported employment, and it is successful for those who actually make it into that program. Two in three people in the program are successfully paired with jobs and maintain them for a year or more. But access to the program is very limited due to a lack of funding. There are 159 people in the program out of hundreds out of hundreds that need it. Our community needs more resources for more supported employment programming. We are working to build relationships with providers such as Vallejo, but we believe that the county should take the lead on developing a plan to increase access to supported employment in Shawnee County. With developing a plan comes a need for resources. So, commissioners, JUMP urges you to consider the return on your investment if you would set aside an additional $200,000 in the next budget for the implementation of such a plan. The mental health resources in our community cannot afford another cut. We believe supported employment is an effective preventive measure and a major ingredient in the recipe for recovery. Not the recipe itself, but a major part of the solution. We are not asking you to take money from the mental health line item in the budget to support this plan. We're asking you to look at the entire Shawnee County budget and repri reprioritize funds based on the level of need in our community and take the opportunity on this issue to prevent crisis rather than have to spend money reacting to crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners, and thank you for letting me speak to you. My name is Anton Arns. I live at 2210 Southwest 15th Street here in Topeka. I'm a member of Trinity Presbyterian Church and a member of Topeka Jump. In two days, I will again put on this shirt, which I proudly wear during school time as I teach my kids at Topeka High School. I'm starting my 32nd year there and my 34th year in education here in Topeka. And one of the real critical areas that I see year in and year out is the need for mental health services, not only for my students, but for their parents, for their families, and others in our community. One benefit of being in JUMP is our deepening relationships that are built within our churches that are member organizations of JUMP. I recently found out that one of my friends at Trinity Presbyterian actually had the services from Vallejo and got those uh, employment advantages that led her to a good, stable job. And she'd been in mental health services for over 20 years that I've known her. That was a real plus for her. And I think we do need to really think about not being in crisis, but make a plan ahead of time that's going to save us money and really meet the needs of people. I appreciate you being at the Nehemiah action a few months ago, and Rev uh, 
Commissioner Archer, I wish that you could have come because I think you would have enjoyed it and, and uh, seen the power of the people there. But it, it really is a need in Topeka that we have. Mental health services have declined and declined and we cannot treat them uh, with the rescue mission and with the jail. In addition to my friends and my students at school that I've taught, it's just a need for this whole community, and there are obviously clear benefits for putting in money now rather than paying out money for the jail and the rescue mission later. <coughs> I'm here today to ask you to set aside at least an additional $200,000 in next year's budget so that we can increase these job opportunities through Vallejo's program with mentally ill people here in Topeka. We can't wait for another 1,000 people to go through the jail to convince us we need this help. I think you should know, too, that next week, I don't know if I'll do it every day, but when I start seeing kids, I'm going to have this shirt, my Jump for Justice shirt, underneath my Topeka High shirt, <laughs> because the real basis of what I do is work for justice, and I try to do it every day, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good, e <coughs> Pardon me. Good evening, I'm Bob Adamson. I live at 1820 Southwest Crest Drive. I'm a private citizen. I'm also the legal guardian of my adult son, Russell, who has schizophrenia. I just wanted to take one last opportunity to mention what I already said to the three of the commissioners on July 1st, <coughs> and that is that the brand new Vallejo Crisis Center has no doctor, either on duty or on call. <clears throat> it does have an APRN from eight to 12, five days a week. <clears throat> My concern overall with that situation is this. Mental health is a brain disorder. It can be treated fairly effectively with chemicals, drugs, pharmacotherapy, but there are only two occupations that have the expertise or the legal authority to prescribe those drugs for patients who need them. And that is a doctor as well as an APRN. Currently, in this brand new five plus million dollar facility, there is no treatment for crisis situations. I know from experience just within the last several months, I'm asking that somehow um, the Shawnee County Commission ensure that some of the money designated to Vallejo for the coming fiscal year be directed entirely to pay for the salary of a doctor. By the way, Chris Wills at the July 1st meeting gave two different explanations for why there is no doctor at the brand new Vallejo Crisis Center. The first explanation I got on the telephone was that they couldn't afford it. And then when I came to the July 1st meeting, I heard a different explanation. I heard Chris Wills say that they had posted an opening for the job, but they could not get any doctor to take it because the job requires on-call status. And apparently we're living in a time when people won't take that responsibility. I'll mention one more thing. Uh, starting in the early 1950s, literally tens of thousands of mentally ill people began emptying out of the state hospitals, tens of thousands. And it was, it was because of the advent of somewhat effective pharmacotherapy. That's what can't be prescribed at the new Vallejo Crisis Center. In effect, there is no treatment for the mentally ill. It's a very good diagnostic and referral service. It has beds for 22 people with mental health attendants, but there is no treatment. I'm hoping that somehow some of the money that you fund to Vallejo can go solely toward paying a doctor's salary. There is no doctor. I'll add one more thing. I've had much good help from Vallejo over the past eight years. It's a real asset to the community. 
it could be much more valuable than it is for the whole community, not just my son with schizophrenia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bob. Good evening. My name is Maisha Thompson, and I attend Gethsemane Worship Center, and I am a member of Topeka Jump. Um, I am also the last one that will be coming to you this evening on behalf of Topeka Jump. I want to just say that a lot of thought went into the goal of our campaign of the $200,000 that could potentially mean an additional 100 people getting supported employment. <coughs> What's most important to JUMP is that the Commission seriously consider this a priority and that we have some collaborative meetings after this week to develop a plan. Commissioner Bueller made that request the 1st of July and we completely agree that we should continue the conversation and build relationships across the table between the Commission, JUMP, advocacy organizations like NAMI, the providers like Vallejo, in a grassroots way we are lifting up the desire from the families in Shawnee County to their loved ones to be able to work successfully. The Kansas Mental Health Coalition drafted, drafted an issue paper on supporting employment that is targeted at the state but is helpful locally as well. The Governor's Mental Health Task Force made a recommendation to the state in April 2014 to expand individual placement and support, supported employment, as well as other evidence-based models of treatment because it demonstrates effectiveness. Since June, we have been meeting with local businesses about effectiveness of supported employment. Some of the businesses that have shown interest at the very least support a community initiative to increase employment opportunities for people with mental illness include Bank of America, Equity Bank, Core First Bank, St. Francis Health, the Parish Hotel Corporation, and, Nissan City, and Capital City Nissan. And we've met with 10 to 15 companies this summer. The support for this is tremendous and JUMP is in this for the long haul. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Wayne Lukert. I'm a supervisor for Shawnee County uh, Conservation District, and I farm out by Dover, Kansas. And um, I appreciate your support in the past for Conservation District and look forward to that in the future. Uh, the Kansas Conservation District Act that was passed by the legislature created conservation districts to work with counties and the people in each county to uh, administer the district law in each county. And one of those things we do is to uh, coordinate and come up with education programs as for natural resource conservation as well as provide technical assistance and try to find that as well as find other resources and monetary resources to carry out these natural resource conservation programs. And uh, we've had a lot of bit of success in this county because everything we do helps this county comply with the Clean Water Act of the United States. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we took a hit on the budget request and everything, but that's the way it goes <coughs> and everything. And, and last year, uh, we stayed uh, flatlined at 40000 as you guys have requested us to do. This year, we asked for a $2,000 increase to help uh, and we've discussed this in our budget hearing earlier as to help cover uh, some cost of living for our full-time employee and our part-time employee. Mm -hmm. This enables us to keep a good full-time employee who can look for other opportunities for us. And this part-time employee enables us to leverage other uh, dollars we can get from other agencies we work with to provide more money for an employee to work with the conservation district. Uh, we're kind of in a unique thing. All our programs are voluntary, and I ask that you uh, support the our budget request. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sherry Marcus. I live at 324 Lindenwood, Topeka, Kansas, 66606. I'm fairly new to mental health issues 
um, because last summer my daughter was diagnosed with schizophrenia. It was uh, quite a shock to our family and we are becoming familiar now with what is and is not available for mental health in Topeka. Um, she has had one stay at Vallejo um, when she became suicidal in the middle of the night and we were very grateful that they were available. However, she is on multiple medications. Some of them um, are very strong and significant and I was very concerned that there was not uh, medical <coughs> personnel available to monitor that while she was there. So I would just like to echo um, and reinforce Mr. Adamson's request that there be a doctor there if some way could be found. And if uh, the on-call requirement is something that is a holdup, I, I don't know if this has been looked into or not. It's something I just wanted to um, throw out as a, what possibly could be a helpful suggestion. If the APRN who is already there could share that responsibility, if that would perhaps clear the way to obtaining a physician for Vallejo, I just wanted to throw that suggestion out um, because it's very difficult when um, there's no place for your loved one to go because everything is full. And so um, when she did go to Vallejo, it was because Stormont Vale West was full. And so to have that medical presence is really important. And if there's a way that could be found, it would be uh, extremely important for our mental health community. And I thank you for listening to me. Thank you. My name is Jan Ash. I live at 3201 Southeast Evening Tideway, Topeka, Kansas. I too am new to mental health um, in our own home, having had um, relatives with mental health. We were faced one night with a critical situation with our son, and um, it was life or death, and we had really nowhere to turn within. Um, a radius of 150 miles. So uh, there was no dual diagnostic facility for my son. He had a bad accident in 03 and left him with a closed head injury and now we've got multiple diagnoses but chronic pain was one of them so he had um, uh, had to be treated for the pain addiction for the pain mm -hmm. meds and the only place we could get him in was Kansas City and it was two days constantly on the phone trying to get some help with that. Now we do have the dual diagnostic center, but it still is, um, in my experience, been very, very hard to get him help. I just tried to call a couple weeks ago when we were in a, a crisis and we were told that he couldn't come there. And um, so we really do need to beat that up if at all possible, because this is an area that is just, it's, it's a silent killer. And, um, you know, it's not like having an arm that's broken and you can see it in a sling, but it's just as serious when uh, people can't function because of mental health issues. So thank you for your time and for listening tonight. And uh, please allocate as much money as you can. Vallejo has been there for us. We just saw a doctor today there, but in an emergency situation, we still need some resources desperately in Topeka. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Eric Harkness. I'm in District 1, and I'd like to uh, say to thanks to all my uh, friends from JUMP here tonight. Uh, I live with a serious mental illness and like several of dozen of my friends I would like to work but I need some help getting a job and uh, uh, several dozen of my friends like I say and there's several hundred others like us in the county who'd like to help you with your uh, tax situation because you know if we uh, had a little help getting some work we could probably be paying more in taxes. Uh, I used to do that, and it, it wasn't great fun, but in retrospect, it was better than my current situation. 
So uh, I'm, uh, I think for what, a couple uh, hundred thousand dollars, the uh, Vallejo uh, Supported Employment Program, which has got a very effective uh, plan in place that's helping a few folks, could help a number of other folks, uh, which could help you with some of these numbers. So uh, as, as you consider this, uh, keep that in mind. Some of us would like to actually help you out with this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Adrian Kell. I am a Topeka resident, a 4-H parent, and a club leader of Shunga Valley 4-H Club. I'm speaking on behalf of the Extension Office for Shawnee County, the 4-H Division. 4-H is simply more than just a club. It is a family. When I grew up too, I was in 4-H, just as my husband was. We felt very strong about 4-H. So strong that we have our, both of our children are now members of the Shawnee County 4-H. 4-H is a program that allows children to develop lifelong skills such as responsibility, ownership for their actions, how to take criticism and feedback, and learn from their experiences. 4-H has taught my children to serve our community. Our club does monthly service projects that benefits not only themselves, but our community. 4-H teaches children how to run business meetings as all of these skills are vital in today's society and in our next generation of leaders. If the county's extension budget is cut, the 4-H program will be cut directly. Not only does 4-H serve the members of the Shawnee County 4-H, but the community as well, such as 4-H in the library and the Shawnee County Fair. The majority of the county's budget for 4-H is returned to the county via rental fees for county-run properties, and the program is already running on a thin budget. Please consider keeping the current budget or increasing it to a higher standard. Not only will this affect the 4-H members, but our community as a whole. I'm also speaking on behalf of three other families um, here in the Shawnee County uh, program. This statement is from the Imparto family. 4-H is a program that allows children of all ages, cultural backgrounds, and abilities to come together and learn many necessary life skills. It is not just about animals and projects. It is about building long-lasting friendships and learning leadership skills, communication skills, and team building skills. These families come from completely different communities and may not have been introduced to each other otherwise. Children in 4-H are learning how business meetings are run. They are learning how to talk to their peers, as well as gaining interview skills when they talk to judges about their projects every year. How many youth will have self-confidence to participate in an interview after high school? These children will. As a parent to a child with a disability, I am constantly trying to find experiences for my child to appropriately interact socially with her peers. 4-H has been a blessing as an ex extra opportunity for her to do that. I want her to learn as many life skills necessary so she will be able to live her life independently and be able to do whatever it is that she wants to do when she grows up. Since she has been enrolled in 4-H, she has already been immersed in many different projects and activities that will give her those necessary life skills. I would like someone to find another project that allows for so much diversity, both with the people you meet and the experiences you are offered. We just finished the 2015 Shawnee County Fair, and my daughter is already planning for the 2016. Please don't take those dreams away from her. Kayleen and Parto. This statement is written by Joanna Richardson. 4-H is more than a club, it is a community. Our family has only been part of 4-H since October 2014, but it has become such a joy in our lives. My four younger siblings have special needs, but that has never mattered. The 4-H community welcomed with friendly open arms 
My younger siblings have developed friendships, confidence, and pride. Just during this short of time, we've been in 4-H. If 4-H no longer is to be funded, we would like it would take away their goals and dreams they've already have for next year's fair. You would be amazed what these little things do to build character and self-esteem in a child. It truly builds up, builds them up to be a better community leader as an adult. Joanna Richardson. And I have one more final statement. Uh, this is from Michelle Black. Dear Shawnee County Commissioners, thank you for your current support for Shawnee County 4-H. I would like to share with you what 4-H means to my family. My husband and his father were involved in 4-H's children and the tradition continued into a third generation with our children. Our children have now been involved in Shawnee County 4-H for seven years. In those seven years, I have seen my children take on roles within our community and club that have made me more proud as a parent. They have learned to be good listeners to others. They have learned the importance <coughs> to serve others. They have practiced public speaking in front of large groups of people. They have shared their talents with others. They have worked as a part of a team to finish the task. They have learned to run a meeting according to Robert's rule of order. I have seen my children make friends outside of their own school setting. Because of the county fair, I have seen them broaden their interests and try new products. I could not, excuse me, try new projects. I could not have taught them on my own. For these reasons, I ask you to consider finding ways to continue your support for the Shawnee County 4-H program. I would be happy to answer any of your questions you may have. Michelle Black, Shawnee County Club Leader. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, uh, thank you for a few minutes of your time. Uh, my name is Rick Kagan. I represent the National Alliance on Mental Illness, the Kansas State Organization. Our offices are here in Shawnee County. Uh, I certainly support the uh, testimony this evening from Topeka Jump members and applaud them for their interest and initiative in strengthening mental health services and I want to speak to an issue which has been addressed uh, in their testimony on the one hand it's not specifically part of your budget consideration but on the other hand it is and some of you may have been uh, acquainted with the stepping up initiative from the National Association of Counties uh, Commissioner Bueller and I spoke about this several weeks ago and I simply want to draw this to your attention because this is a important national initiative from your national body as, long, as well as the Council of State Governments and the objective is simple to reduce the number of individuals with serious mental illness in our county jails and that's costing you all a pretty penny uh, right now so this is not a quick fix uh, in terms of spend a hundred thousand now say five hundred thousand later I mean this is going to require some planning and what is outlined in this document is a planning process that we would like to encourage you to make a commitment to the final attachment uh, in the packet that I've given you is a a template for resolution that a number of counties across the country have adopted uh, to make that commitment to reduce the number of individuals with serious mental illness who are incarcerated uh, I think as everybody in this room might agree that jail is not the place for people with serious mental illness we need to make those investments elsewhere so the call to action on the front page here uh, ask you to consider a planning process bring the right people together from uh, law enforcement and uh, community corrections and uh, advocacy groups in the community and providers and others and begin that process that will lead to uh, some solutions further down the road this is a long-term problem it's not going away and we appreciate your 
interest in the issue and hopefully your willingness to commit to a process like this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Greg. Commissioners, my name is Bill Lays. I'm a resident of Shawnee County. I live at 1921 Southwest 32nd. I'm here to speak on the, in support of the extension budget. I'm a master gardener and uh, currently serve as treasurer. I've got a one or two page handout here to provide it to you. I just want to take you through this very quickly. And it shows some of the value of volunteers in the extension service. And if you look at the first graph, it uh, points out that there's been nearly 19,000 hours of volunteer service last calendar year provided to the extension service. That comes from a variety of services, including uh, consumer services, horticulture, 4-H, and another. We even received a, uh, uh, well, a small variety of services. Part two speaks to the budget and the funding sources, and those are laid out, as I understand them, principally from Shawnee County funding, Kent State University, uh, special grants, and in-kind support. We even received a grant, or a gift, of $6,500 last year. Uh, who gives money to the government? I, you know, it was a gift because of the work that was being done with the extension service. Uh, so it's important to note that, I believe. Uh, the third part on the second page, points out the, the extension uh, and the value of volunteers. And I took these numbers from the Kansas Department of Labor, which pr publishes information on average wage from, for the state and those for Shawnee County, both for all industries, the entire economy, and for local government. And you see in Shawnee County, the average wage was about $16.77. Uh, and then the bullets below uh, point out that 19,000 hours last year is based on a full-time equivalent. This would be about nine positions that uh, are serving Shawnee County residents that are totally volunteer uh, staff. And then the second is that the 1.1 million was brought into the Shawnee County economy last year as a result of these programs. And we all know that there's a multiplier effect with any influx of funding into the economists will tell you it varies from one point from one to uh, maybe as high as five times so if you take the high end uh, we're uh, we would feel that we're pumping about 5.5 million dollars back into shawnee county residents to the shawnee county uh, area through the purchase of additional uh, goods and services that come about largely because of the uh, exceptional service that this uh, government agency gives. You don't get those kind of grants unless you perform, particularly from universities like Kansas State and, and other sources. So uh, I, I just simply believe that uh, Shawnee County Extension Service is some of the best government you can get. And it's government at its best. So I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Don? Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Miriam Crable. I'm the president and CEO for the United Way of Greater Topeka. It's nice to see you all, and I don't envy your positions in having to make these decisions. You're hearing about some incredible things that are going on in our community and things that um, need to be even better. So we have a lot of work to do, so I appreciate all you're doing. I'm actually here, though, to uh, speak on behalf and in support of the extension budget line. Um, United Way has been a partner with extension as it does its VITA work, the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program, for many years. And we feel that it's probably one of the best return on investments that we ever make. Um, for $5,000, United Way gets to be part of 
bringing about $10 million back into the community that probably wouldn't come otherwise. So of the uh, approximately 8,000 residents here in Shawnee County that they're serving, they're bringing that money back home here. And people are able then to spend that back in our community. And without that, many of these folks would not have their taxes done because most of them are not required by law to do that, right? They're not at that income level that requires them to file taxes. However, because of tax credits that they're able to get, this service done completely by volunteers, which is amazing as well, um, brings that money right back here. You know, it's very hard to sometimes measure exactly what happens when you take people from the community and utilize them as volunteers, but what you're doing here with hundreds of volunteers that are managed very effectively, and from a United Way perspective, I can tell you that's a huge job to be able to coordinate that number of volunteers in a short period of time to provide assistance to some people who have no idea really what it means to file taxes is really incredible and they're giving of themselves back to the community so when you think about all of the things that extension is providing through the vita program it's something that i just would hate to see go away um, as you know the docking building is coming down and so one of the sites where many many people went to have um, these services provided is now having to be replaced and it's been a pleasure for united way to really work across the community with the extension offices to find new places to house these services, whether it's at the Topeka Housing Authority or any of the other uh, places that we're trying to come up with, we're really searching for in incredibly cost-effective ways to be able to do this. And cost-effective in some cases, believe it or not, actually means free, right? So there's a lot of ways that pe this collaboration is coming together to serve these folks effectively and make sure that that money that's due to these people really comes back in because these are these are working families. These are folks that are working hard for their money and we want that money to come back and we want them to reinvest it back. So I would truly encourage you to support the line item uh, for the extension offices and know that um, you're not alone in that investment. There are others investing as well and uh, we appreciate being in partnership with you on that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Good evening, County Commissioners. Good, me good evening, everyone. My name is Abel Frederick. I'm a Director of Community Impact at United Way of Greater Topeka. Uh, I'm the staff liaison for the VITA program. I'm also the lead staff person for our work in financial stability. Uh, in our work with financial stability, what we see a lot of the times are, are families that come to us that can't balance their unsecured monthly debt, that aren't saving money. Uh, VITA is a big part of that. As Miriam echoed to you, she said that um, as Miriam echoed to you, she said that many of these families uh, are not required to file taxes, but a lot of them are. VITA has served every year about 8,000 people in this community uh, through their services. It does bring back a $10 million investment, but what you also don't know is that this is one of the highest functioning volunteer tax organizations within this region, as stated by our IRS. Um, by cutting this line item out of the budget, you're cutting the legs off a very high functioning organization, very high functioning volunteers. I, for one, can tell you how hard it is um, to manage volunteers um, in, an in a high functioning way, uh, in a high functioning organization, uh, when you don't have very many resources, when you have to pull those resources together. Um, when you, don't, when, you, when you don't have partnerships uh, that are in place, when you have to go out and develop those partnerships. As Miriam alluded to, you know, United Way is out there trying to be a convener. Um, and that's why we're here today, uh, because VITA is such an important program and they are such an important uh, partner uh, within the community. I really just want to echo on behalf of what Miriam said in United Way that you all aren't alone in investing in this program. You all aren't alone in investing in this community. And that's exactly what this is. This is a community investment. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Angie McConnell, and I live at 5920 Southeast Barrington Road. I'm here tonight also to speak on behalf of the extension, specifically the 4-H. However, the entire extension staff helps to support the 4-H group. 
4-H is a great youth organization that promotes citizenship, leadership, learning, community service, teaches these children communication skills, interview skills, as well as many other life skills. In every project that they take, they not only learn the specifics and learn how to master those individual projects, but within that, they're also, once they master some of the learning, they're taking that and putting forth leadership to teach others that learning as well. They're learning how to communicate about that project. They're learning how to serve their community within that, by doing community service projects within that individual project, and also how to be a better citizen. The 4-H citizen programs develop well-informed citizens involved in their communities while teaching the youth leadership and decision-making skills. Kids blossom in 4-H. They're more productive. There's been many studies that say, at least one study that says 4-Hers are four times more likely to contribute to their community as adults, two times more likely to be civically <coughs> active, two times more likely to participate in science programs outside of school as high schoolers, and two times more likely to make healthier choices. You're investing, by investing in the extension services, in the future of this community. And these children will bring this back to you, which will reduce your at-risk, because the more children that we can get involved in 4-H, the more reduction you're going to have in at-risk behaviors. I recently was able to chaperone a trip for our school, and all the other chaperoning and things that I had done was all 4-H related activities. And while these children at the school were very well behaved, it was a different level than what the 4-Hers are held to. The 4-Hers are always held to a higher standard. And in countless parent-teacher conferences, I've always heard that you can tell that this child was a 4-Her and when other children weren't 4-Hers. Now I'm going to give you the opportunity to hear firsthand just what 4-H has done for some of our youth. Hi, my name is Chase Kell. I'm a, a fourth year member of the Shawnee County 4-H program. Through 4-H, I have learned life skills such as taking notes and reporting what happens at our med monthly meeting. I have learned how, how lead groups activities. 4-H has allowed me to experience things that I would never not have been able to do on my own. Please support 4-H. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tamara McConnell and this is my seventh year in 4-H. I am part of the Auburn 4-H club and I started out as a very, very shy member that didn't want to talk to anybody and then a couple older 4-Hers came up to me and they showed their leadership skills to make me more comfortable with my surroundings. And now that I have been able to grow up and become the leader that they were to me, I am now able to do that to them, or to the younger kids. And I have started a clothing club to teach the kids different things. And a couple of my little seven-year-olds, or even the Clover Buds, they love to teach me and show me what they've accomplished and I'm so proud of all of them and I would not want to cut their opportunity at all. And 4-H teaches you so many different skills such as leadership and citizenship as well as it gives you the opportunity to see what careers you may want to choose in the future and lets you find out what your true calling is. Thank you. Thank you. And just in closing, several of the community service projects that the 4-Hers do reach out to several of the other organizations within the community. They help organizations such as TARC, the Rescue Mission, Helping Hands Humane Society. They also help organizations such as Sheltered Living. And th just all around, they do a lot of wonderful things. So thank you for your time and your consideration in the extension budget. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Colonel Retired Mike Slusher. I'm here uh, to kind of change the subject a little bit, talk about a completely different issue. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the Sheriff's budget this year. Uh, I've spoken at least with uh, Ms. Bueller during your campaign trip about this issue. I've talked to the Sheriff. 
I've talked to some of the sheriff deputies. I'm not affiliated with the sheriff's department or have much interest in becoming affiliated with them, but I think that they have some issues that need your assistance on. Now, I, I sat through at least the video portion of the departmental hearing you had on it, and I heard everybody that talked, including the sheriff and all three of you, talked about the issue of the pay scale within the sheriff's department, and that is a concern to you. And I know that, and, and I appreciate that, but I don't think that that's within the, the time frame it needs to speak. One of the things I heard said was, you know, we're going to look at that in three to four years from now. That's probably a little too late. In the last six years, the people that they've recruited for the department, you've already lost 50% of the folks that you were able to bring in. People are leaving your agent. If you can find them, which I appreciate is very, very difficult, but if you can find them, they don't stay there. And they don't stay there primarily for pay. In each year, you've lost people. Probably 75 to 80% of the people you lose is directly, directly related to pay. Now, you're going to have to, you've already got some pay studies, but the, the simplest pay study is tell me why a person can walk in the sheriff's door if you can hire him and he receives less money than if he had taken a left and walked in the police department door. There needs to be a parity there, and it needs to be at the entry level. If you get it at the entry level, it'll work its way out as you deal through this whole thing. And I appreciate that this is extremely complex. In listening to the budget hearings, one of the things I couldn't understand was your sheriff presented you with a budget that really didn't address that, it really didn't even address fully funding all the positions that you've already authorized. So I have no idea at what level funding you're funding that agency, whether you're funding it at 80% of the requirement or whether you're funding it at 100%. I suspect it's much lower, but you've got, you've got a personnel issue. You don't have enough, meet, enough people assigned to meet the needs that you have now, and that's only going to get worse for you. When you have a person that you hire and you go through a fairly extensive hiring and training process and within 12 months he leaves the agency to go drive a truck for waste management, you got an issue there. When you have a person that's worked for you for a couple of years and he leaves and you, you know, invested and you've trained him and he goes to be a truck driver for Frito-Lay, that, that's an issue. And it is a public safety issue that will only continue to be to dig you into a deeper hole if you don't try and do something about it. I would never, never want to sit in one of your seats. You know, I've listened to all the things that you've had to do tonight, you've had to listen to, and a lot of these are extremely compelling, you know, heart-pulling issues, and, I, and I, I share their concern with them. The only thing I'm talking about tonight is the Sheriff's Department. And as a citizen, because you normally hear that from a union member or from a uh, member of the facility of the organization, I'm telling you, this exists and it concerns me. It concerns me enough that I've come here and I've talked to you. It concerns me enough that that was the only subject I brought up to you during your your campaign issue. And I suspect if I can't see anything done on it, I'll continue to talk to other people about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. Good evening, Commissioners. <clears throat> My name is Randall Walker. My wife and I live at uh, 2326 Southwest Hodges Road and have lived there since May of 66. We both had long careers in education and we both had the, she helped me write this, and I wrote outstanding and she wrote priceless <laughs> experience. <laughs> experience of, of working with the excellent people in K-State Research and <clears throat> Extension <clears throat> in Shawnee County. We still volunteer. My first involvement with, ext with extension occurred about 1972 when I began farming here. While I wasn't new to farming, uh, I was new to farming here. When you grow up in central Kansas, they grow diff different things in different ways than they do here. I'd never even seen a soybean until I moved here. And corn was simply not grown there at that time. One of my neighbors, a farmer friend who I think got tired of my questions, suggested I call her Bulk, who was then uh, the county ag agent and the director and I found him to be a resource beyond belief and later as our son and daughter became old enough our neighbors the Riley suggested 4-H like thousands of, of county youth 
our kids learn the skills and life lessons that have been discussed here and mentioned that serve them well into adulthood. Our daughter and her son are still active in 4-H and both participated in the fair last week. She is a livestock superintendent and he in photography and meat goats. Incidentally, it pleases me greatly to note the, the positive influence 4-H has been on him as well as it was on our own children. My wife and I both served on program development committees and on the extension board. There we quickly learned that Shawnee County Extension is much more than just ag and 4-H. It also includes educational programs that benefit the residents of this county as a whole. My focus, however, tonight will be on agriculture. <clears throat> While I expect it's apparent to all that agriculture, even in this urbanizing county, is big. Food, after all, is fairly important. It's right, it's right up there with water. It takes good farmers to help this industry to be successful so we can all continue to eat. Few would argue that farmers are better farmers because, the, I'm sorry, few would argue that farmers are not better farmers because the education program is provided by extension. Because of extension, I believe we continue to produce more food with less inputs, including water, which we all know is an is a important topic in this state. Over the years, many of us in farming have attended a large variety of extension sponsored workshops, crop tours, and such that enabled us to learn from from and interact with top professionals in the field who are, res who are supported by research from K-State and other land-grant universities. Through extension, we also have met and shared and, and borrowed ideas from our peers, thus making beneficial connections for future references. I'd like to think if you didn't gain something from meetings that, that extension has put on, then you were asleep. It's also been very reassuring over the years to be able to call people like Dean Davis, Leroy Russell, <laughs> or Jamie Hancock, all who are recognized as top people in their field, and get a question answered quickly and correctly. Now, if it's a question that warrants more information, or particularly tricky, and they've not had experience with, mm -hmm. these local people know the K-State Research and Ex Extension person to call. And I think that's much better than Google. We in agriculture shudder at the thought of that services provided by the professionals in Shiny Cat Extension would be diminished by funding increases. And I realize, as you've heard tonight, I realize that funds are always tight and that's just another reason that others have already said extension is a really good investment. The funds you provide are extended exponentially by the educational model that's used by extension. That includes networking, collaboration, and hundreds of volunteers that together help our programs to be successful. Two recent examples, the county fair and farm to youth. Very large activities that involve lots of people, uh, do good things for lots of people, simply couldn't happen with just the staff that we have. It's the staff and the volunteers. So we are indeed fortunate to have an outstanding team of highly qualified, I believe, and motivated individuals, support staff, and volunteers. These volunteers are recruited and trained by these professionals and staff in Shawnee County, and they together help our programs to be successful. They and their programs, I believe, are second to none, and they and their programs are recognized not only in Kansas, but statewide, or, I'm not in, statewide, but uh, regionally, and some nationally. The programs I speak of are not key state programs, but rather Shawnee County programs that are requested by residents of this county and developed here by volunteers and program development committees and local extension staff. So in conclusion, in the 51 years I've lived and worked in Shawnee County, I've had the opportunity to serve on quite a number of volunteer boards. And I'm happy to say without hesitation that serving on the Shawnee County Extension Board was the most satisfying of all. Perhaps that's because I'm an educator and the focus of extension is education, but that would be the easy answer however, that produces a smile on this face. Uh, it's the professionalism and personnel that I see, uh, professionalism, other personnel, uh, that's overall, top to bottom, in, of Shawnee County Extension that positively impacts so many across a wide age group, and I encourage your, your continued strong support of Extension. Thank you. Thank you.
evening. How are you? Debbie Childers, and I am here. I am a, a also a program development committee member of the extension office, and I am here to represent my opinion on uh, supporting them. Please, uh, you've already heard so much on 4-H, and it is so much more than 4-H. Um, most of us relate to it because our children have gone through it. I'm a I'm a past 4-H leader, past. Uh, 4-H project leader and then my kids grew up and I came to work for Shawnee County and got to know the extension from that side of it and you couldn't ask for more professional people I truly believe the budget they've turned in has probably been scrutinized very well and I hope you take that into consideration part of what I do also and, and I've been before you before is through Dover Pride and I want to talk to you about that aspect of what the extension office has done for Dover and I'm, I don't want to speak for other communities but as you know Rossville was the beginning of, of Pride and I'm sure they couldn't have done it without uh, the help of the extension office and they are definitely a role model to the rest of us and Silver Lake being the newest just coming on board um, Without the extension office guiding us, I, I don't know where we would be, to be honest. Uh, right now, though, we've got all kinds of volunteers, and so you've got this professional staff of the extension office that pulls together you know, a group of people that have a, a dream and want to start something, and then we, we go out and grab more volunteers, and our volunteers seriously range from this high up. The last project we had, we had some pillars, just little short pillars that needed painted, those kids were out there with paintbrushes, and you can't tell me that we're not planting seeds. And without, again, the guidance of the extension office to, you know, tell us, you know, guide us and teach us how to lead our volunteers, we couldn't do this. And uh, this morning, before I came to work, I had a meeting with our FFA teacher in our school district because they have a, a, a conference, I guess, or a convention coming up on Wednesday. And the FFA kids are going to finish a project for us, and that's what we were coordinating. We're bringing it in. So we're bringing the schools into our back, in our case, back into our community. But we're also going to turn around and approach the uh, superintendent and the school board about us coming to them now when they have things that they need volunteers we can collaborate together which is helping our community so I again without the extension office we wouldn't be able to do any of this we it's so I, I've heard a lot of what's been said tonight and what I notice and, and given things that I know I've seen in the paper um, just as I was um, standing there my phone kept beeping Shawnee County is kind of in um, a reaction mode I mean there's lots of things not good things going on all over the place, whether your county, whether your city, and the extension office doesn't focus in just one area. And that's where my pride group comes in, that we're, we're taking back our communities. And by bringing that pride back in, whether it's the youth or getting an elderly person that's got a skill to come back and, and, and teach somebody how to do something, you're, you're bringing it back. And when somebody takes pride in something, they usually don't vandalize it because they're proud of it. And so if we're starting it now with our young kids, you know, I, I think that's going to help. And if, you, if, that, if that momentum that the Dover Pride or Rossville Pride or Silver Lake Pride can do, you know, it can come into your, your uh, the, I'm sure the Extension Office has ways of bringing it into your neighborhood communities. You know, it, it's going to grow. I mean, I think we're on to something, and again, without the Extension Office to guide us and their professionalism and their knowledge and everybody they collaborate with, we wouldn't have it. Shawnee County can't afford to bring in that collaboration. But at the other, on the other hand, where you guys can't afford to bring it in, I think public perception is that they are a part of you. Most people don't realize that they're not part of what you guys are doing right now. They don't realize that you're allocating, that they're just not auto automatically a funded department. The imp they have a wonderful image which benefits all of you guys because it makes you guys look really good and they've been doing it for a long time, I promise you. You know, so I, I guess I want you to think about that or if you've got a, if I can elaborate on something more that maybe I've skipped over and I apologize. I had a, uncle had emergency surgery and I need to get out of here and go. So <laughs> I am talking a little fast. So if you've got something I'd like to elaborate on or you need me to elaborate on, that would be fine. But um, again, my part is the pride community and what we're doing and I think it can grow and I think with the extension office I've seen when they do their workshops to bring in professionals and I mean we're the the people sitting down for the workshop are the professionals. We're being taught by other people how to run boards. You know, you volunteer your time and you sit down and just like with you guys, did you get a rule book when you sat down? Mm -mm. 
you know, so they're giving us guidance that we wouldn't have professional guidance, and yet they're bringing in professionals that are giving their time. So when we talk about all these volunteers, let's remember those volunteers are people like you guys, like us, like all of them that are sitting out here that are giving their time after work, and they're all being guided by a very professional staff that really, I don't really believe can cut their budget any more than they have to. So with that, I thank you for your time, and I don't envy you your decisions, because no matter what you do, somebody's not going to be happy. So thank you, and good evening. Thank you, Debbie. I think you guys have my address. <laughs> My name is, <coughs> excuse me, my name is Richard Rombaum, and I live at 31, 31 Southeast 77th, that's in Barrington, and I want to thank you for listening to all of us, and there's a um, lot of things that um, that brought up. Um, I can relate to a lot of that because I was a 4-H uh, member back in the mid-40s, and I could go back further than uh, this fellow right here, and I, um, I told him he was uh, taking my win from me, so I'm not <laughs> going to try and duplicate anything he said. I've <laughs> so I'm going to try and uh, tell you some of my experience that I had with agriculture and with Extension Service. Um, I started out in Nimhall County and um, started out in 4-H, and I had the privilege of having um, Bill Collins as a 4-H agent and her, bo uh, her bulk as Extension agent. He started out in Nemaha County. So uh, I traveled to a lot of uh, conventions, a lot of um, seminars and stuff with Herb. He took me 4-H Roundup, and it just like he helped me uh, a lot. And, and I'll let you know that <coughs> I am, when it comes to agriculture, I'm not a, uh, a big farmer or anything. I'm just a small apple in a big barrel. I, um, I want to let, let you know how much extensive service had helped me. I came to Shawnee County back in the 60s. In the 70s, I bought my farm and had an experience with uh, some aerial application, which wound up being a problem. I got a phone call. County agent was going to come out and help me. I never said anything to him. And who was it? It was Herb Balk. And uh, he came out and gave me a lot of advice. And um, so then after Herb Balk, why, we had Dean Davis. And Dean Davis was another one. I went to a lot of his seminars, how to handle uh, um, pastures, crops, hybrids, you know, many, many other things. And you can imagine how much more he helped the farmers. And if it wasn't for farming, in agriculture, probably a lot of us wouldn't be in this room. And just like uh, Randall said, it's as important as water. Um, also, uh, later on, technology started changing in extension service. And then I got to know Leroy Russell and many in his staff. And uh, I had people calling me on problems they had. I tried to help him out the best I could, but I always had a backup. I had the extension service. And if they couldn't answer it, they always called you back. I give them credit. They always called us back. And a number of the things that I was involved with the extension service was um, we worked with a lot of teenagers and youth, um, especially through the services of um, Water Festival, Farm to You, History and Environmental Fair, uh, numerous other things. I, um, I just um, can't begin to mention all of them because uh, Leroy said I had two minutes to talk and two minutes won't, two minutes won't cover it. <laughs> and uh, um, a lot of these children were in second graders. And you know, and fourth graders, and they know nothing about agriculture. They think their food comes from the grocery store, and they're not getting the education in these schools. Uh, so they rely on uh, extension service, 
conservation district. We all work together. And um, I, um, I am involved with um, the extension service with uh, animal emergency. We, uh, we work with large animals, small animals. And fortunately, uh, a lot of our meetings are kind of dull. That's a good sign because nothing's seriously happening. And we're always glad, glad we can go to a meeting like that. Uh, they work with uh, diseases you know, in case of disa a disaster. Uh, we try to uh, things, get things under control where uh, we can handle a situation. Um, and another thing, if and they draw in people from the state and the county, and we share knowledge, and um, so it's vast knowledge we get from everybody getting together on this, and, um, and a lot of that technology is coming out of K-State, and I'm a, that's probably why I'm a K-State fan. I hope you don't hold that against me. <laughs> and anyway, anyway, um, technology, I want to close. Technology and education does not come cheap. And so we need that technology there because um, things are changing in agriculture. Thank you. Thank you. I know, I said I wasn't going to speak. <laughs> Uh, in, in our 4-H club, I, my name is Ann Foster. Um, my children are a member of the Rossville Wrestlers 4-H club. My husband, Alan, serves on the extension board um, and has for several years. Um, uh, in our 4-H club, sometimes I get up and I tell the kids something, a project that we're going to work on. And usually in 4-H you have specific leaders. And I don't call myself a leader, I just call myself a busybody. Because I kind of, you know, just pick up a project and help the kids with it, whatever it might be. Um, and as you can tell from the different individuals who have spoken from Extension, um, it seems to me that maybe Shawnee County Extension is kind of the busybody in the county. They've got, they've got their hands in everything. They're helping everybody. They're partnering with lots of different people. Um, and I also wanted to say that since we've just finished the Shawnee County Fair, um, I can guarantee you that everyone who is here from 4-H has dirty laundry, dirty dishes, <laughs> and projects scattered all over their house. Mm. So this means a lot to them, for them to come this evening uh, and spend their time. Um, extension is very important to us, and um, it, it serves a lot of people in this county. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening, commissioners. My name is Lynette Hudson. I promise I'll be brief. Um, I live in Shawnee County. We're in the Rossville School District. I'd like to echo what a lot of people have said about the 4-H program specifically. One angle that I would like to have you consider it from is these young leaders are getting civic-minded lessons now, whether it's going to camp as a camp counselor, going to Roundup as a leader, they are teaching the next generation that's coming up. And what we encourage people, whether it's Citizenship Washington Focus, where they go to Washington and they do things, and they see how the, the legislature is run, these are opportunities they wouldn't get. So I would look at this as you're investing in the next group of young adults who are going to be earning an income, putting it back into the system, and volunteering their time. Because that's what their leaders are showing them is that's the way that you act as an adult. So I look at the thousands of dollars that we spend on sports, and don't get me wrong, we're from Rossville, we love sports, <laughs> but you look at how many become professional athletes, probably not near as many as become professional engineers, scientists, horticultures, so by spending the money with the extension office, you really are getting the next generation of leaders coming through. So thank you for your time. Thank you. 
Commissioners, my name's John Payne. I'm out in Barrington, 8225 Southeast Retina Road. Uh, and I'm sp speaking for the Extension Office budget. And uh, I've been in 4-H when I was a kid, and my mom helped start the Riverside Club, and my kids have all been through it. So I bleed green, and I'm kind of partial to it. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about right now is the uh, spin clubs that we have. Uh, at the national level, <coughs> the 4-H, they've wanted the counties to look at the demographic of the population served and compare that to the demographic of the 4-Hers and see if there's differences, blah, blah. And so uh, we've done that here in Shawnee County. And we're as good as we are because we have these short-term clubs, what they call uh, special interest clubs that come up with a model that if you can couple a, uh, a passionate adult on a topic that is of interest to kids and you have kids that are interested and you have some kind of facility where they can meet, you can meet, they, they just came up with six times, but you, some, some predefined amount of time you meet with the kids and it's just like a mini club just for that one project. <coughs> and that allows us to reach out into what would be underserved uh, members of, of our community. So, and I've been lucky to, to, to have one of the spin clubs on, it's on geocaching, but we also have spin clubs that helps uh, kids uh, learn teaching or uh, cooking skills at the uh, rescue mission and nutrition. And I've worked with geocaching with uh, Mount St. Asbury, uh, United Methodist Church, and Antioch Baptist Church. They'll have summer programs for you, so I'll go work with them for six times, about an hour, and then get them out actually geocaching and, and watch them get excited. I find that they like, they like the same things that the agricultural kids like. Uh, they're they're just a hoot to be around. So I hope you let us continue working and support our budget proposal. I'm on extension board too, so I got to see some of the behind the scenes coming up with those that budget numbers, and it, we didn't put fat in there for you guys to trim out willy nilly. So I, I hope you consider it. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, I don't know if you need that or not. I'm kind of short. <laughs> uh, my name is Mary Gleason, and I'm representing the Dover area. Our children are in the Dover 4-H club. Well, actually, we have five children. My husband and I. He was a Dover 4-H member. I was a member of the in Sedgwick County 4-H, so I know a little bit. Bring a little knowledge of larger city 4-H demographics, also. Four of our children have moved on. Three of them have graduated from college, and two of them are back at our ranch. We have a ranch near the Dover area. Our youngest child is still in 4-H. We, um, I have seen, we have been in it for 20 plus years, and I've seen the growth of all kids, not just my own, but other kids that were the same age as my children, and I've seen them come back and volunteer and help other, help their talents and spread their talents with and knowledge with other kids. I especially watched it this this week at the fair. I was really proud of my kids and other kids that we've uh, watched grow up helping other 4-H'ers with their projects. We actually are more in the livestock division, but I know it goes on throughout the entire 4-H uh, projects. Watching my older kids help the younger kids learn things about their projects, um, how to how to present their animal for the best the best that they can. I even watched my youngest child, who was still in 4-H. He was lucky enough to be um, they called him Round Robin. He was a top showman in three of the species that he showed. He was out there helping another 4-H'er while he was showing, showing him how 
to be a better shower. So I don't know how much more you can expect of your children. But we're, 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 uh, our ultimate goal is to raise children that become fine adults that contribute to their community. And I think 4-H does an excellent job of that. The young kids, they come in, they don't know what's going on, and, and these older children come in and they teach these older, younger children just leadership about their projects, you name it. And those little kids look up to those older kids like they are, like they're something. And um, they want to emulate, they want to be just like that older 4-H'er. And those, those older kids, they, um, it gives them a sense of purpose. I see so many young people throughout the, the community, not the community that we're involved with, but kids that aren't involved in anything. And I see those kids, they don't have a purpose. They're getting into trouble. They have, they have no direction. And 4-H gives these kids direction, a sense of leadership and pride of their community. And if we don't have the funding, if you guys can't, if the commission does not continue to at least keep the budget where it is, 4-H I believe is probably where we'll bear the brunt of it because they're a large part of the budget. And I'd really hate to see that happen because we're lo we would lose what the kids, what develops the young adults the best. And that's, and that's ultimately what we're trying to do, is to make better citizens. Thank, Thank you. Becky Gleason. I'm actually Mary Gleason's daughter. Um, I'm, speak <laughs> I'm speaking on behalf, you can probably guess, of the 4-H Extension Program. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I actually started 4-H when I was 7, and I continued on until I was age 19. If you do the math, that's 12 years. That's a long program. That's a long time to mold these kids. In my family, like my mom said, I'm not the only one that did 4-H. My mom, dad, and then my four brothers, they continue that legacy and these traits that helped you know through 4-H. 4-H help helps you with many different things. I can think of probably three traits that really come to my mind. Being competitive. You know, in 4-H you get one shot, just like in real life. You get one shot just like I'm giving you right now to impress people. Is that true? Yeah, you got one shot. <laughs> it also teaches you teamwork. I'm from a family of five. You can imagine how much teamwork had to go on in there. You can see that, I mean, we just wrapped up the 2015 Shawnee County Fair. You saw multiple kids helping each other out. Everybody cares about each other, just like you want in a successful society. It also teaches you social skills. That's how I'm able to speak in front of you today. 4-H helped me with the base to help me be able to speak to you and help me with my coworkers, now my professional career. These multiple traits help you become a strong, independent leader. 4-H is basically like a revolving door. Older members are constantly coming in and helping out with these younger members. I decided last year to pay it forward and to become actually a member of the Livestock Committee for Shawnee County. I'm now the Sheep Superintendent because I wanted to continue to help these kids with these traits to mold them to become strong, independent adults. When you're in 4-H, volunteerism is kind of like a drug. Honestly, <laughs> it pushes you to volunteer constantly. As an adult, since you know I do help with the 4-H, it also made me want to join Big Brothers Big Sisters. I'm a big sister to a little. I actually brought my little sister to a pig show this spring. First thing she says, Becky, I want to show a pig. So we'll see where that goes, but that just shows you these kids, they want to be involved in something. They want to help. I mean, I see it in my generation, social skills, it's gone by the wayside. Technology, fantastic. However, you're constantly having your phone, your head in your phone right here. 4-H doesn't teach you that. You gotta set the phone down, set down the technology, and you have to interact. In 4-H, you, you are interacting with the judge when you get that one shot that I was talking about. And constantly, you have to keep showing yourself off to people because you wanna do the best that you can. 
if you continue to keep, I know it's hard. There's many de different decisions you, you have to make. However, if you keep decreasing the budget for Shawnee County Extension, it's going to make it harder for volunteers like myself to help mold these kids to be strong, independent leaders in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wishes to speak tonight? Um, okay. I don't know if anybody wants to follow Becky. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty energetic. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I might add is that the motto for 4-H is to make the best of it. Absolutely. Um, as it's been said, there's a lot of tough decisions to be made. Um, and it isn't easy. But we do the best that we can with the resources that we have and we live with and make the best better. This is the 4-H motto. And so as we move forward, I can tell you that as a commissioner, all of your comments are being taken to heart and they will factor into the decisions that we make in the upcoming weeks as we craft the budget for the 2016 year. Commissioner Mueller, any? Thank you all for being here. It's, I think we have set a record a record, really, um, and we had, I, I have counted 24 speakers. Uh, I don't know, I'm, I was supposed to be at dinner at 6.30, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, so this, it's okay. this, this is government <laughs> at its best, it's people letting us know how they feel, what we need to invest in, um, so I, I just thank you for, for attending, I really do. Yeah, uh, I am kind of disappointed we didn't have many uh, supporters of the extension service here tonight. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Bueller said it, said it right. This is government at its best. Uh, I've learned a lot, and uh, I, I thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedule and uh, educating the commission as we move forward. So thank you all. With that, I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Motion made by Commissioner Cook to close the public hearing, seconded by Commissioner Bueller. All in favor say aye. All opposed. We are now closed and we are adjourned. Sorry about that. Oh, that's